I'll be reading Luke 12 through 13. 12, 13 through 21 in the, pew, in the Pew Bible. You can find it on page 16, 17. Starting at Luke 12, 13. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you, and then he and then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain, of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. Then and I'd say I'd say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God towards God. That's like one good kid right there. Awesome kid. You know, I remember when uh, you were in uh, TNT, you were like this, now you're like this. Thanks. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, he's an awesome kid. Such a great young man. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the scripture. Thank you for this church where we get to see young men like this who have grown up here and love you and, and desire to serve you, even as a high school student living for Jesus on their campus. So proud of how these young people are living for you. Lord, we want to pray that we live up to that same passion for Jesus as we see in the youth in this church that just are striving to follow you with their whole hearts. Lord, let us be on fire for Jesus too. Thank you for an opportunity to be in your word today. May you speak to us and may you work in our hearts that we might love you more even today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Three clergymen uh, go in together to buy some lottery tickets. It sounds crazy, you know, we're going downhill here. Okay, and, and then they win millions of dollars. And, and, and so the, 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 one, the first one, the Baptist minister says, you know, oh, we've been blessed with so much. Um, we should probably give some back to the Lord. And so what should we do? What should we do? They're thinking, they're thinking. And he says, I know what we should do. We should, we should make a circle and we should take all this money. We'll throw it up in the air. And what lands in the circle, that'll be, that'll be the Lord's. Okay, that'll be the Lord. And then the other one, the priest says to him, he says, you know, it's a pretty windy day. How about we do it this way? We throw the money up. What lands in the circle will go to us. And then the Lord can have the rest. The rabbi, he's here on this too. And he says, I don't know, man. How about this? Let's throw it up in the air. And whatever the Lord wants, he can keep. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Oh, man. Okay. (laughs) All right, we're talking about greed today. I guess it goes in all of us, right? Um, and so you, it's been a while. I, I had a Sunday off, and I have to start with a bad joke. Okay. So uh, I know some of you are like, where were you last week, Pastor Sunday? Were you at the Sounders game? Uh, I wish. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Uh, uh, we went to see our son Josh in Chicago, and so we had to spend some time with Josh. And, and the crazy thing is, is on Wednesday night, my wife's getting texts from a friend who, who has connection with season tickets asking, do we want tickets to go to the Sounders game? <laughs> and my wife says to me, honey, who do we love more? <laughs> Men, let me just tell you one thing. When your wife asks you a question like that, it's loaded. Don't pause. It's not good. Okay? I'll just tell you that. <laughs> Who do we love more? Josh. I think that was the right answer. Eventually I got there, um, and it was wonderful. So we had a great time seeing our son uh, and, and an opportunity to visit him at Moody. He's in Chicago. Um, and then on Monday, we were uh, stuck in Chicago because as we, won, we went to fly out Monday evening, uh, O'Hare had closed. They had uh, canceled 200 flights because one, just one, only one airplane slipped off the runway. <laughs> I guess it happens. And so they decided to cancel. And so, yeah, so we didn't get home until Tuesday. And so, oh, great days. All right. Well, um, today we're talking about the rich fool. It's another parable. It's a parable of Jesus. Uh, and this is the parable of the rich fool. And it's interesting because when we look at this, it's talking about living wise. It's living wise with a sense of urgency. Remember, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Be ready. 
Be ready. Live wise. Live wise. And so, yeah, because death comes sooner than we expect. Death is going to happen. But it's not just that death is a reality. It's, just, it's that it's unexpected. And so live wise for the way, for the life that we have now. Let's, let's honor this, right? And, and so let's look at the setting first in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, and you can follow along. Uh, early on, it says is there's about thousands of people, thousands upon thousands of people are there following Jesus. This is one of his sermons um, that we have recorded that he's preaching, okay? And then all of a sudden, as he's been talking about the, you know, if you don't deny the son, he won't deny the father, all these eternal messages, all this about eternity and living for eternity, this man stands up. And it's like, let's play the family feud, right? In this corner, we have the angry brother, and I imagine him pointing to his brother in this corner, um, the other brother, and this brother says, hey, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And you can imagine if you're this brother going, not in front of everybody, come on, man, do you have to bring it up now? You know, why are you doing this? And it's like putting putting the rabbi on the spot. And that rabbis did that in this day. They, they were arbiters. They, they, they helped people negotiate things in their families. And so it wasn't so out of bounds, but it wasn't the time. It wasn't the context of when he should be asking this. And so, we, but, but what's odd is he commands Jesus. He uses this imperative uh, with Jesus to tell Jesus, do this. And in the Greek, it is just with this, this intensity. It's the same sense that we, when, when we, tell that, we talk about Peter or Paul or, or John or Jesus telling us, this is the way to live. You must do it this way. This is the same intensity of the verb. Jesus! I mean, we don't talk to Jesus like that. Not this way. But then what is he saying? Fix my brother. Fix him. Not me. The problem's not with me. It's not my heart. It's him. Fix him. <laughs> I never hear that as a pastor. <laughs> Not at all. Like when people go, you know, that sermon would have been great for my husband. <laughs> you ever say that? It's not me. That's not for me. That sermon would have really been good for my neighbor. <laughs> you know, we always we do that too. It's not, uh, it's not me. I'm not the one needs fixing. It's somebody else, Right? And that's where we might be like this guy a little bit, right? And so look at Jesus' response. Man, man, what a cold term. Not brother, not even friend. Man, who appointed me as judge or arbiter between you? Ouch, ouch. And what, what Jesus is saying is he said, I'm not that kind of judge that works for you. I'm not that kind of judge. I am a judge, you're right. I'm going to judge your soul, but I'm not the kind of judge that works for you. I am a judge, and I want you to get that right. And, and in just a minute, I'm going to reveal something about your own soul to you that's going to scare you, right? And so, so don't miss that. And then verse 15, Jesus says to them, watch out. In the ESV, take care. Uh, in the NLT, beware. And then it says, be on your guard. It's a military term, Right? Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Covetousness, in a couple of your versions of the Bible, it'll say covetousness, right? Uh, be, be warned. Now, now, it's important to recognize that Jesus has already warned them uh, earlier on in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. He's already said the yeast in the Pharisees, but in this sense, he doesn't say... Be warned against greedy people like this guy. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, beware of greed or covetousness that is in all of you. Ooh. That's where this comes. Not just in them, but in all of us. And so that's where this is. Because what Jesus is beginning to talk about here is greed is about an appetite, not accumulation. Greed is not a, a problem of only the rich. You can be dirt poor and be very, very greedy. It's not about what you have. It's about what you want. It's about what you desire. It's about the emotion. This word covetousness, this word greed is a lust for stuff. You can have your magazines that you lust over for, I don't know, food? I don't know. Cars? I don't know. Hunting stuff? I don't know, you know, Costco, 
uh, right? <laughs> I get that in my coupon, coupon, no, you circle, right? And it's all those things that get us, right? Right? You know, you live my life, that's true, right? We're like, ah. What are the things that come after us? See, lust for more. We'll have a lust for more is what this is all about, right? We can have that stuff. Here's what Tim Keller says about this. He says, even though it's clear that the world is filled with greed and materialism, almost no one thinks it's true of them. (laughs) Greed hides itself from the victim. Ooh, ouch, right? So verse 15, he says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Next part of the verse. A man's life does not consist of the, or in the abundance of his possessions. And abundance is in, the, in, the, in the, the wealth of it or a lot of it, right? Having a whole bunch. Now, the word life, a man's life, there are two words for life, okay? A little Greek today, okay? Um, bio, biology, life, vital signs, okay? That's life, just the simplicity of life. This is the word zoe, okay? Zoe is the idea of real life, satisfaction, fulfillment, enjoyment, all that brings meaning and purpose. The, the, it's not, your, your meaning and purpose of life is not found in the accumulate, accumulation of the things that you have. There's more to life than just stuff. You are more as a person than just the accumulation of the crud around you. That's what he is saying here. And so then what he says in verse 16, then he tells a parable. So that's the setting. This is the context of what's going on. Now he brings us to a parable, okay? This man in this parable makes three mistakes. I'm going to point out his mistakes to make sure we don't make the same mistakes in our life. And Jesus doesn't call us a fool either. That's the warning. Don't be called a fool by the Lord, okay? How many of you, when you heard that statement, goes, I thought Jesus said, don't call anybody a fool. How can Jesus call somebody a fool, but he's breaking his own rule? You didn't pay attention to that? Only I ask the weirdest questions. I don't know. I'm going to have to answer it for you then. Okay. Verse 16. Then he told them parable. The ground of a certain man, rich man, produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. First mistake. He mistook his net worth for his self-worth. And that's so easy for us today to mistake our net worth for our self-worth. See, this man has this presumption that his wealth is due to his cleverness. It's not. If you notice how Jesus sets up the parable, what produced the great crop? The man? No, he says the ground. The ground produced the crop. What we don't realize is how often we take credit for God's blessings in our life. How we take credit for the way God has worked in our life. I love hearing when I hear like, uh, let's say, a basketball player or a, an NFL player talk about how awesome they are at what they do because, and how hard they work at what they do. And I would tell them, I could work exactly as hard as you, but never dunk. Right? I could work as hard as you, and I could try as hard as you, and I could never be an offensive lineman. Part of it is because how God has blessed you, and yet so often they forget to give God any glory, any privilege, or any, any opportunity to receive anything for what God has done in their life. Even us in America, God has blessed us with so much, even our intelligence, e- even our opportunities for education, our opportunities for all these things, and yet we take credit for what God has done in us. And that's what this man is doing. And his presumption is that he has earned it all. He's done it. And, and, and it says that the man produced a good crop. No, that the ground produced a good crop. Now, this word, yeah, Greek lesson for you. Okay, Greek lesson. Here you go. Okay, I know some of you don't like Greek, but let me show you how good of a Greek student you are. Okay, can you tell what English word comes from this Greek word? The word for good, good crop here is euphoriaon. Huh. Yeah, anybody notice euphoria? Same word. Literally is two Greek words, good yield, which we get this sense. What happens when you get a good yield? Euphoria, right? You feel great. This is what it is. So back in that day when they had a euphoria or euphorion, they had a, euphor- a, euphor- a wonderful experience, a great experience. It was like when, when you get that bonus check, 
When you have a really good sales month and man, all the finances come in and you're like, oh, this is awesome. What a great month. I've been so blessed. This is fantastic. And you have a euphoria, right? What do you do with it? What's your first thought? When the blessing comes in, when you have that euphoria of, of some major blessing, some really good thing happening in your life, same sense for you and for me. He's asking a question, where do you go with this? And he puts it all right in us, right in that sense. Are you like this guy or are you different? How are we different than this fool? That's the great question. Right? And so as we look at this, it, 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 he, he says, he thought to himself. <laughs> it's like the guy who says, I talk to myself because I need expert advice. <laughs> he would expect, what's this guy going to do? What's he going to do? He talks to himself. <laughs> Why? If you listen to him over and over, there are like eight my's or mine if he's got like my barns and my crops and my grain and my goods and myself all he's saying and it says i talk to myself in the greek it's the soul the psyche i talk to myself he said to his psyche his self why is he talking to himself because maybe he's all alone maybe he's pushed everybody out of his life he's so selfish he's got no one else he doesn't say to his workers, hey, what should we do with this? He doesn't say to his wife or his family. He doesn't say to his God, Lord, what, what should I do with this amazing blessing? His, what should I do, self? Sometimes we like to talk to ourselves because we don't want anyone else's advice. Sometimes we talk to ourselves because we don't want anything other than what our selfishness wants. We don't want to ask anyone else's opinion because it might, they might disagree. They might point out my selfishness, and that would be scary to hear. And so when, when he says, uh, uh, I, want, I want to build more ground. Why would, you, why would you tear down your barns and build bigger, taller ones? Not just add more barns. Because that's going to take away from the land. And that's going to take away he create more crop. So he's going to just increase it. And he's going to make it bigger. And he's going to store more. It says his goods and his crop. He's going to hold. Why, why else would you do that? Why don't you just sell it all and then think about maybe helping the poor or, or, or tithing or giving some away. But no, 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 no. I'm going to hold it because I'm going to be in control. I'm going to let it out a little bit at a time. I'm going to control the supply and the demand. I'm going to keep the price up. I'm going to do it this way. So I'll store it so that I can control it so that I can control my life. How many people, how often are we like this, folks? I don't want to have to rely on God. I want to save and store up enough so that I can rely on myself. I want to have so much that I don't need to ever trust in God again. Oh, we're self-dependent. We're Americans. We're self-reliant. We're pioneers. We went west for a reason to establish our own selves and to establish our own, you know, our, our own, what do you call it, uh, uh, par, uh, area, you know, your par, parcel of property, and you're supposed to be settlers, right? And we're going to be self-reliant, and we're going to do this. We don't need God, do we? He wants to be in control. In verse 19, he says, I, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Literally, Jesus, it, it literally it says, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample. And then he says, and here's the second mistake. He must took his body for his soul. His body for his soul. Okay, uh, uh, this is a little bit weird. I've been thinking about this for, why has God created us the way he created us? H have you ever thought about this? When you think about evolution, and, and evolution says we've just evolved over these years, there are some questions and some things that evolution cannot answer. There are some things that we experience that evolution cannot answer, and one of those is pleasures. Why do we have so many pleasures? Sure, we can eat. But God has given us the, 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 the taste flavor, right? Number one flavor that you have, chocolate. Okay, that's mine, okay? We have these things that we like, right? We have things that we, that we coffee, okay? Or that, maybe that's a smell, I don't know. You know, we have these things that we smell or that we eat, that we enjoy. That these are these things that we enjoy so much, but we don't, they're not necessary. What about color? Art. Monday we were stuck, and so Chris and I were like, well, let's go to the Chicago Art Museum. 
I know it sounds nerdy, but it was, I like it, okay? And they have in this, I should have, take, I should have brought a picture. I have a picture. I took a picture of it because it's really cool. American Gothic. American Gothic is this old farmer man with a pitchfork and, and, and his wife there. Such a cool painting to look at. And then it has Rembrandt's bedroom, and it's got these, uh, some of these pictures by Monet that I just love to look at. And then why? Why do we appreciate colors? Why do we appreciate art? Why do we, music, sound? Uh, why do we, we like these things? There's no logical reason, according to evolution, why these things exist. It's because, according to 1 Timothy 6, 17, that God gave them to us for our enjoyment. Because he loves us. He's given us all these things to appreciate and to enjoy. But there's one part of us, I believe we have more than five senses. I believe we have six. And I'm not talking about the movie, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about the sixth sense. That's a different. I'm talking about the sense of the soul, that my soul has this longing for God, that there is something inside of me that longs for God. And this man, he totally mistook that. He totally missed that. David talks about the fact, he says, my soul longs for you. And because he has so much, he wants to build bigger barns because he's trying to find something that he can't find on his own, he's trying to find security. And your soul needs security from God, not from anything else. You can do everything you can to try to find security in your life with having enough stuff, but there will never be enough. The Romans had a proverb. I put it on your, your, uh, your outline there, that money is like salt water. The more you drink, the thirstier you become. And that's the same thing. That is true for us, that you can never have enough. When is enough? You know with Americans, they say that for most Americans, uh, uh, if, they, if, they had just, if they made just a little bit more, they would be happy with life. If they made just a little bit more money, they would be happy with life. You know what that number is? The number they have discovered is $11,000. If people made $11,000, they would be happier with life. That's what they say in all polls. Isn't that crazy? What a weird number. But, but we're looking for things in this world to make us happy, and they'll never make us happy right? And he was not judged because of his success. He was judged by the way he handled it. He was judged by the way he handled it. And God's like, why don't you bless someone else? How do we hoard things? How do we store up things that we hoard? Uh, I realized this last year. Last year, we were doing our, 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 our clothing drive, our drive for cold weather gear. And, uh, and I, I looked through all my coats and I went through and I saw a soccer coat that I had worn years ago when I uh, coached uh, soccer for a select team. It was a, a bright colored coat that doesn't match the, the high school that I coach with now. And, and so um, I never wear this coat. And, and I was looking through all of my things. And I'm like, why do I hang on to this? Well, I don't need it. I won't wear it. So I took that out and I put it in with the pile that went to the mission. And I'm like, um, I don't need it. I'll get rid of it. And, and, and so I let it go. But there was part of me that's like, you, you hang on, you might need it. You just might need it. My wife thinks I'm a hoarder. It's a counseling issue. We need, okay, but that's okay. Uh, uh, but, but, I'm, but I let it go. And then I'll tell you, I was driving along. I was driving over by Walmart. And as I drove by Walmart, I had to slow down because it was a stoplight. And I see this very disheveled woman wearing a very bright white and blue soccer coat, full length. And, and I was so humbled, almost to tears, realizing why did I hang on to that so long when someone else needed it way more than I did. And I'll tell you, when you let go of something and you give it to God, that it can be used for his glory, for someone who else is in need, your heart, my heart was touched by the fact that, that I realized why do I hang on to things that I don't need when I need to bless people, give away. And what I think the Lord is trying to teach us is when we are rich towards God, we actually get blessed back in ways that we could never expect. And, and, and realizing we can do that with finances, we can do with other things. Uh, but in this sense, when Jesus is saying, what are you doing with what you have? The third thing, the third mistake he had was he mistook time for eternity. Time for eternity. Uh, let me address that word where he says, and, and, and I will say to myself, I'll have plenty. I'm going to do great. I'll have all this. Take it easy. Life, eat, drink, be merry. And God says to him, you 
fool. Now, if you know Matthew chapter 5, you're going to know that Jesus says, anyone who, sa who says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. Woo! But Jesus did it. Here's the deal. The word that he uses there in Matthew is moros. Whoever calls someone a moron, you're, you're liable for hell, fires of hell. Okay, that's judgmental, it's mean. This is Ephron, okay? From the Greek word uh, phron, uh, uh, to mean think. And whenever you put an A in front of a word, it's like anti or without, to be without thinking. Hey, fool, or hey, person you who didn't think, let me enlighten you to something. He's telling all of us, don't be a person who doesn't think. Don't be a person who doesn't consider all of the teachings of the Lord. Don't be a person who thinks it's not a big deal. Don't be a person who thinks that your way is the only way. You need to look at what the Lord is saying here. This very night, this very time, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? You know, that's a greedy person's worst nightmare. I work for all this stuff, and who's going to blow it? Who's going to waste it? Who's going to go squander all that I did? They're going to spend on things that are stupid. Right? That's a greedy person's worst nightmare. And verse 21 says, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. What's this man's greatest problem? His problem is that he never, it never entered his thinking that when he was blessed, he should bless God and bless his neighbors. Remember, it's our vision statement. It comes right from the scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love Jesus. And when God blesses you, love Jesus, right? And when God blesses you, love your neighbor. When God blesses you, make sure that you are a blessing to those around you, not, not just for yourself, right? See, the whole attitude that he has is the very reverse of Christianity. It's the very opposite of Christianity. He's only thinking of self, not thinking about making an impact, not thinking about doing anything for the world around him, for people around him. How about you? How about us? Uh, spiritual maturity requires us to come to a point when we say, God, you've blessed me so much, you've loved me so much. Lord, how could I not love you in kind? How could I not love you in the way that you've blessed me? How can I not treat you with the same kindness in the way that you've treated me and treat others? How can I not be that same way? Oh, many of you have been in this church for a few years and some of you for a lot of years. And so you're going to know some of these names that I'm going to talk about. Mike and Velma Griffith. Mike passed away in the late 80s and his wife in the early 90s. Um, she had Alzheimer's and he left his estate to pay for her Alzheimer's treatment and to take care of her before she passed away. When she passed away, they left their, uh, a chunk of their estate, more than $200,000 to this church, a large chunk. It's what paid for the whole addition to our church as you walk down to the bathrooms where the, the ceiling uh, is vaulted like this and then all of a sudden it's flat. That part of the building wasn't there uh, up until about 1993. It was dedicated to them, to, the, to them in 94. They gave money for the library then, for the children's classroom across the hall, for the youth center down below. They, they gave money to make a difference. And you, can you imagine by doing that, the investment they made into eternity and all of the ministry that happens in there, all that happens for God's glory, people that have come to the Lord in there. And imagine getting to heaven and someone coming to heaven going, I, I got saved in the youth room that you paid for. I, I, I learned the Bible in, in, the, in, the, in the, the library that you paid for because they gave to that, made a difference of that. When you think about, but the application of what we're, we're thinking about here, there's three things I want you to think about. When blessed, first seek God's wisdom and his ways, not just yourself. Don't just look to yourself. Seek God. Pray about what you should you do. Uh, seek someone. Ask someone. Come to your pastor and say, what should I do with this? Howard Gage, in 2007, came to me and said, Pastor, when, when I die, I want to leave all my retirement uh, to the church. What should I do with it? What do I want to do with it? I'm like, well, Howard, let me, let me give you some options. Um, you could put it towards the building and we could build something. I had no idea what he was talking about, like financially wise, numbers wise. And I, I said, we could, we, could put a, we could build a building uh, and, and dedicate it uh, to you that way, uh, or that way. Or we could do uh, something else. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, you could give it to camp. 
You could help out camp with it if you want to. Um, no, I don't want to do that. I said, well, we could do a, a scholarship in your honor for people wanting to go into the ministry. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Well, he had always, his mom wanted him to go into ministry. He, he had grown up in a family that was, his parents were divorced. When his stepdad came in, his stepdad was real abusive to his mom, real abusive to him. He got in a lot of fights, and he began fighting God. As a child, though, he grew up loving Jesus, loving God, going, going to church, uh, following the Lord, and had a passion for Jesus. But, but as he got older, uh, when he was, was 12 years old, he was going down to the pool hall, and he was beating people at pool. He, he would tell you his story of this, and, and then he would he learned how to play pool at the YMCA because he was in, in the city where Maytag was, and the owner of Maytag bought YMCA passes for all children in that community, so he grew up learning how to shoot pool and he got really good at it but he was he, he also learned how to be a boxer and so he became a good boxer in his teenage years and he was always fighting but he wasn't just fighting people he was always fighting god he went into the navy uh, at age 17 years old before he was supposed to he was he was on the arizona um no I mean, he was on the nevada which was parked behind the arizona when pearl harbor was hit his ship pulled out and listed uh in the harbor uh and so but he was he spent 40 days in the brig, got out, got in another fight. 40 days in the brig, got in another fight. He would get in and out of the brig because he was always fighting. He was fighting God as much as he was fighting everyone else. There was so much anger in him. There was so many, much anger in him. And when he was in um, Texas, um, he, he had a taxi company. He said, and the Lord spoke to me and said, come back to church. He, and, and sell your taxi company, and he said, okay, okay, so he, 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 he got on the phone, and he listed his, 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 his uh, taxi company for sale, I think he had like nine cabs, he was down in, um, down south in Texas, I don't remember the exact uh, location, um, and, and so he sold his taxi company, and, um, and, and he said, go to church, and so he went to church that night, a Baptist church, Right, praise the Lord, and, and, um, and, and, then, and God worked in his life, and, and, you know, and then when he, now he's telling me, you know, my mom always wanted me to go into ministry, and I want the scholarships to go to kids going into ministry. Little did I even know that 10 years later, our son would receive that, a call from the Lord and now receive scholarships to go into ministry. How crazy is that? I mean, Howard had a dream. Howard shared his testimony in our TNT kids, in our uh, Awana uh, ministry many, many years, touching those kids, telling them about loving the Lord and living for the Lord. He, gave, he made a difference. He's making a difference. And a second thing is this. Look beyond yourself to be a blessing. Look to beyond yourself. When I became a senior pastor here in this church, uh, uh, one of the things we wanted is the projector. We wanted to get the projector going early on. I started uh, at the end of August, um, and so we had a few business meetings, and we were trying to, to get this all to going, and we had nothing in here. If you remember back in that day, we had an overhead projector that some of the slides had footprints on it. You know, I remember that one. It was so, it was so we had some work to do. And, and, and our sound table back there had, was smaller than my youth group sound table uh, and, and soundboard, and I was like, oh, man, we've got, we, we want to get some things going here, and, and um, I really want to get this going. And so I brought a presentation to the elder, uh, actually that time it was executive committee, and I said, we want, to, we want to get a projection system going, and I found one with this company, and it's going to cost about $15,000. Oh, we don't have that much money. Uh, we can do it this way. Well, so we can, all we need is a projector and a computer, and it's only, we can do it for maybe $7,000. We have $5,000. We probably can get this figured out. I said, well, this is a lot of parts. I don't know if we can figure this out, and, and this one includes all the extra parts. I know it costs more, but, but I don't know about this one, and, and I'll take responsibility for this one if, and God will raise, if God will raise the money, and, 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 and who wants to take responsibility for this one? Nobody. <laughs> it's like, uh, 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 uh. So he said, well, let's do this. Let's just pray and ask God to provide. Let's ask God to provide, you know, uh, the ministry moving forward. And if God wants us to move forward, it'll move forward. That was decided in the executive committee meeting. Executive. It was just a few weeks later. We're in church. And, and uh, one of the children of the Rothlers stood up. He said, I have a gift from my parents' estate that we want to give to the church. Uh, who do I give it to? I said, me. <laughs> so I, I, I ran it to Rita. I get put it in the offering plate and they took care of it. And then after the service, Don comes up to me. He goes, oh, the check's for $10,000. So we had five already. It was going to cost $15,000. I said, go ask him if we can use it towards the projection system. Okay. He goes running off. He comes zipping back to me. They said yes. We were like super excited. It was so exciting. They said yes. And we were moving forward. And God answered prayer because someone provided. And, and they didn't know what we were working on. God knew. God was working in their hearts to give. We were trusting in the Lord to provide. And God provided through them. 
Seek the Lord, and he brings things together for you. And when you are rich towards the Lord, and it's been so exciting how we've been able to use this over the years. Sometimes I like pictures, and sometimes I put the words up there, and it helps you. And look what it's done for our church over the 19 years. It's been such a blessing. It's been such a blessing. Here's the last thing, right? Um, when you're blessed, look beyond this world and be rich towards God. Look beyond this world. Look beyond the things that are just for yourself and invest for the kingdom. You cannot take it with you, but you can send it ahead. You can send it ahead. So let's pray. Lord, we so desperately want to be like the man who is rich to you. We don't want to be a foolish person who doesn't think, who hasn't opened our, our minds to your word and your way of thinking and only looks to ourselves. So Lord, bless us that we might in turn be a blessing to ministry here and around the world. Use us, Lord, that we too might be kingdom changers. We too might walk in a way that blesses you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand?